Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Prudence. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to this talk today. Um, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Ferguson, who is going to do a brief introduction and start the conversation with all our speakers. Dr. Ferguson, you can unmute. Got it. Thank you, Prudence. So good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's good to see that there are lots of people in the room. Um, this is, I believe, the fourth in the series of Zimbabwe Dialogues, uh, considering parts of the Zimbabwe Biodiversity Economy report and examining ways in which the biodiversity economy of Zimbabwe can be uh, expanded and facilitated. So today we will look at standards and certification and how those can feed into the process of the biodiversity and the wildlife and the plant economy of Zimbabwe. Um, I think we're largely Zimbabweans in the room. There'll be some South Africans and hopefully some others from SADC. Our panel today, um, I think we have the full team on the panel now in the room, um, is Ms. Patric Ms. Patricia Warambwa, uh, the Chief Operations Officer of Bioba, as in Biobab. Um, Prof. Retired Dr. Valden Smith, from Stellenbosch University's Department of Botany and Zoology, and Mr. Gus Le Breton that you will know uh, if you are active on social media in the environmental and resource, uh, natural resource uh, world in related to Zimbabwe. Um, I am a, also, I, I'll facilitate this as far as I can. I am professionally involved in the standards and certification field, uh, but I've been a consultant in wildlife use and conservation for many, many years. Prudence will share the facilitation with me. I'd like to hand it over briefly to each of our panelists just to introduce themselves. Gus, maybe you go first. So yeah, hi everyone. Uh, it's amazing to have so many of uh, you here on this. Um, I've been in the uh, sort of bio trade world for a long time uh, in Zimbabwe, uh, about 30 years. Um, and I've also been involved in certification um, and the establishment of uh, two different certification systems uh, relating to biodiversity, um, not specifically plants. Um, one is uh, the ethical bio trade standard, which is uh, administered by an organization called the Union for Ethical Bio trade. Um, particularly relating to the ABS issues around um, Nagoya Protocol compliance, ABS issues around uh, bio trade ingredients. And then the other one is the Fair Wild Certification Standard, which we're going to be hearing more about. Um, and I'm a current board member of the Fair Wild uh, Foundation, um, the Swiss based foundation. Uh, fair wild. So, um, yeah, hopefully I can bring something useful to this discussion. Thanks for that. Uh, Valden, do you want to just introduce yourself briefly, please? Yeah, hi, everybody. Um, I am unmuted. Um, I must say that this is definitely the biggest audience I've ever seen on a Zoom meeting. Um, but uh, I'm an ex-academic. I retired about eight or nine years ago. I was um, in the bot botany and zoology department. My my main interest, all my research, my whole life was in the subantarctic, um, doing whole systems ecology. And when I retired, uh, my wife was general manager of EcoCert in um, South Africa. Um, EcoCert is one of the largest um, organic certifying. Uh, bodies in the world. And she asked me to come as a freelancer and do some, some organic audits. And so I started that and then it developed into doing some fair trade audits the, with the Fair for Life standard. And also as part of EcoCert, I was also given a few assignments to do uh, fair wild audits. I did Bioba quite a few times. Um, and then last year, I was asked to participate in revising the Fair Wild Standard, which we spent a year doing, and the new standard version three 
as um, was published in December. And currently, I'm training up auditors worldwide in the new standard. So yes, that's that's my background and uh, my experience in fair trade and organic certification. Perfect. Thanks very much. Okay, people. Then what I would like to do is. Um, there's quite a lot of us in the room today, and what I'd like to do is just briefly run through kind of a standards and certification 101, because what I suggest or what I suspect is that um, among the attendees, you know, there'll be people like Gus just mentioned and, and, and Prof. Smith have just mentioned who are professionally, who've been professionally involved for some years. But there's also going to be people who have heard the word certification and Kind of probably have heard of the word of stand the word standards, um, but don't really understand how the process works and how they relate to the bigger picture of how um, resources are utilised sustainably. So let me just run through this very very quickly. The ZBE report um, mentions the word standards I think nine times and the word certification twenty one times, and it's only really in the glossary at the end. Uh, that certification is defined properly. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that are use the word standards. You know, if you work active in the carbon space, then you know about carbon standards. If you are, work in South Africa at all, you will have heard of the norms and standards, which relates often to rhino management or elephant management. Individual organizations um, and associations often have codes of practice or uh, codes of conduct, which are kind of analogous to, to standards as well. Um, and then there are things like the responsible tourism guidelines uh, as well, which are uh, indicators or, or, or attempts, policy attempts to try and set a standard. Basically, the analogy of standards is like the education system. It is um, a, 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 a standard is set and people or practices are tested against that standard. And if you satisfy the requirements, then you get a certificate and you have passed. So that, that's kind of bear that in the back of your head in terms of, of, of how certification works. The bottom line is you can't have certification without a standard. You know, there needs to be a blueprint against which the certifying happens. So the your, your practices in field are measured against a standard that has to be there first. The whole concept of standards has been around for a good long time. Um, the organization I work for, Forest Stewardship Council, has been active in Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe actually had one, had a, I think, the first FSC certification in the late 90s. Um, and certainly in the wildlife industry in general, there's been talk of certification of different parts of it since at least 2010. Um, so basically, what is the purpose of all this? You know, why, why do you do it? Why do you do standards and certification? And essentially, the answer to that is twofold. You are trying to uh, establish and assure best practice in the production or harvesting environment. And the second is that you are trying to assure the end user that a standard has been maintained all the way through from the product or the the which is 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 either harvested or produced. Um, it's not a marketing tool. You know, I've had this, I have this quite frequently chucked at me that standards and certification are just a marketing tool. It's not. It's a lot more than that. It is a business. It's a set of business principles, basically, by which you run your production business or your collection harvesting business. And then those standards are followed all the way through the value chain to the consumer. Real standards then, and, and this word standards and certification kind of is being used more and more and more. And I'm scared that it's a little bit like sustainable and sustainability. It kind of, it gets used so often that it, to a point, becomes less meaningful. Um, so I, I, I just want to kind of define what real standards are. You, you know, you'll be familiar with the Standards Association of Zimbabwe, SAZ, or SABS in South Africa. They certify, they set standards for products, be it a timber beam or a piece of steel or something. 
they define what it should be and then they test the product against that. And if it passes, then it gets a stamp on it. You know that SAZ triangular standard. So, um, similar, there are in the environment, in the environmental world, you're not so much testing products as you're testing management and harvesting processes. Um, there are obviously products individually that are, are, are certified, um, but it's, you know, it's essentially, it's bigger than that. You're, you're working on the whole process. Um, ISO, you will all have heard of ISO, it's the International, Organ uh, International Organization of Standardization. And there's the ISO 14,000 family of standards, which a lot of organizations, a lot of corporates, a lot of um, industries set themselves uh, up using the ISO 14000 family of standards. Um, and there are, ISO is one of us of the standard setting organizations. For a stewardship council where I work is the same. We are, we are a standard setting organization primarily. We do other things as well. Though. So what should a standard contain? Basically, typically standards have a kind of a hierarchical nature. You have principles, you have criteria, you have indicators and verifiers. Um, and I'm not going to go into any detail on those. You can Google these things and go and find out exactly how they well work. But basically, that is a hierarchical system whereby uh, you are defining what should be happening. You know, if you were to take, for example, labor, your principle would be we're going to treat the labor fairly and well and correctly. The criterion then would be that there is no discrimination. Uh, the indicator below that then is that there is equal pay for for example male female if they're doing the same job males and females are paid the same amount and your verifier is how you check on that uh, how in other words you then draw the, the pay slips um, and of a male and a female and you check that so it's a sampling process um, those principles in a standard are typically in the environmental world are basically the three pillars of sustainability, social, environmental, and economic, or if you speak the other language, people, planet, and prosperity. So all of those have to be equally balanced within the standard, and the standard needs to include all of those things. Standards are typically set by groups of experts in the field, uh, in the forestry world, or in the plant world, or in, you know, they're, they're, they, they are set by people who are acknowledged as in as experts in their field um, and with that they're typically voluntary um, which raises the question of how the uh, laws of the country and and standards relate to each other basically uh, the government has laws and regulations the private sector uses standards you know it's voluntary you don't have to do it but if you want to be measured against the benchmark of what is best practice in whatever industry you're in, you need to have a standard and you need to have certification against that standard. Certification, going back to my analogy of, of schools and exams, is you're writing the exam. Um, it doesn't, the certification is simply the testing of it. It is not done by us. It's not done by the standard setter. There's, it's almost always a third party uh, that is independent from the standard setter. You can't be the lawmaker and the policeman uh, and the judge and the executioner all the, in the same organization. It has to be separate, separately. Uh, there has to be separate responsibilities in that. And certification can happen at several different levels. It can happen at the level of the harvester, the person who uh, is producing trees, for example. Um, or it can be at points in the value chain downstream. And if you want to ensure the whole value chain uh, is represented and that the trademark that then appears on your product is th that that then represents from producer to consumer. At that point, I'm going to leave it. Um, I think let us go through then on our panel um, and I'm going to ask each of you to embroider that and amplify that if from your own perspective um how should how, how does standards work and how should certification work 
in our world. So over to you, Gus, maybe first. Great, thanks, Richard. Um, so maybe just to start with giving my perspective on uh, the importance and the value and the, the use of uh, certification standard. Um, so talking about the, at the sort of production side of the value chain, so whether I'm producing a, a, an animal product or a plant product or whatever it is, um, if I am a producer or a processor um, and I am concerned about issues of you know, social equity and sustainability and all the rest of it, um, obviously there are going to be higher costs to me from engaging in sustainable practices than there would be in engaging in unsustainable practices. I mean, it shouldn't be, but, but the reality is that there are. And if I'm going to incur those costs and my competitors, let's say, are, are not, I would like to be able to differentiate myself from them. So I would like for the consumer to be able to know that products that they source from me have been sustainably produced. And that obviously requires there to be some sort of independent system of arbitration, uh, certification to allow the consumers to proactively choose my product over those of my competitor who is not engaging in the same, to the same degree in terms of sustainability. Um, so really, that's for me what certification at this level is all about. It's, it's about enabling us as the producers to differentiate ourselves from others who aren't engaging at that level. And it's empowering the consumers to make a proactive uh, choice as a consumer uh, that they, they choose a product that they can guarantee has been uh, sustainably produced. And of course, the challenge in the biodiversity world is that there are very limited certification systems that exist that really do that. Um, and even the ones that do exist, um, the, the Fair Wild, the Ethical Biotrade and others, and, and the FSC to an extent as well, Rainforest Alliance, uh, they don't really go the, the whole hog um, in terms of demonstrating the uh, biodiversity impacts, biodiversity benefits, uh, because it's complicated. It really is complicated. And uh, that's, I think, is a big part of the challenge. Uh, on the other end, if you're a big company, you're, uh, you know, you're, a, let's say you're a cosmetic company and you're buying um, ingredients uh, and you want an easy way to, to tell if your ingredients um, are being sustainably harvested. And it's, you know, it's obviously very expensive for you as the company, let's say you're based in France and you're sourcing an ingredient from Zimbabwe, uh, for you to go to Zimbabwe and do your own on-the-ground assessment of the sustainability of the raw material uh, supply, it's, it's impractical and it's not feasible. And that's why certification system exists. And the whole point being that uh, an independent auditor will come and verify and then issue a certification report. And then you as the customer know. And, and, the idea, of course, being that the customers are uh, the the buyers at that level are driven to proactively source uh, their raw materials from certified suppliers because they know that that minimizes the risk for them uh, and maximizes the benefit. So that's basically um, the certification system as I see it, and and why I have been. Uh, involved in it for we lost you or certainly i lost you for a moment there gus at the very end but thanks for that 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 carries on um from the to kind of bring out the market side of all of this and yes you know the market forces drive this as i said this is a private largely a private sector thing and so it needs to be the market and it you're harnessing market forces to make the differentiation one to create the demand and two to create the differentiation between a 
product which does and a product which does not uh, comply with various standards which may be social, environmental and economic. Prof Smith, I'd like to hand over to you and just ask you for your um, reactions and thoughts to it to add to that. You've been involved in organic certification for some time. I'd like to hear you know your your thoughts on this. You can unmute yourself. Just unmuting. There we go. Um, yeah. So first of all, Richard, just let me say that uh, I haven't been a professor for quite a long time, but even when I was, um, my students all called me Valden. So um, <laughs> hi, Patricia. Glad. Look, nice to see you. Hi, Valden. Um, okay. So to follow up on what Gus said, and also what you said a bit earlier. Um, I think that an important point that you made is that the issue of traceability in the standard or a certification. So you might have a producer of a product, say a wine grape, and then you'll have the, the maker of the wine. Um, they might be the same person, but the whole concept of the organic of an organic certification is the producer might have his certificate certificate and the winemaker another certificate and then the brand holder could have a certificate but there will be a follow-up in other words if the final product's organic the raw product was organic the processing of that product was organic or certified organic and any any way that was handled after that would have been according to the organic uh, principles and there is a formalized system of traceability, the auditor will, will trace the product. And I think that's quite an, an important thing for the consumer. It, it does also add to the confidence. Um, I'd like to also just say something of what I've been seeing in sort of a, a change in the demand for certification, let's say of, over about the last 15 years. Um, the the producer who wants to be certified uses that certification as a as a, not a marketing tool but to get a competitive advantage on the market and there's nothing wrong with that but what we've seen is that um the organic the growth in the org request for organic certification the growth growth in the organic certified market has slowed down a lot lately, over about the last, let's say, 10, 10 or 12 years. And that's because it's already at quite a large base. But the big demand is coming in for some sort of fair trade certification. Um, I, I have no proof of this. It, 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 it definitely has. The, our fair trade clients are doubling every year, whereas our organic is going up about 5% every year that's a client basis but i have no proof of what i'm going to say now but i think i think what's happening is people in europe and perhaps in america in the united states look at africa and south africa and say well it's a big place it's a big clean unpolluted place um and perhaps they don't put so much of a of a premium on the fact that it's organic it's an unpolluted place it'll be clean but they are very aware, and there's always um, these horror stories on, on TV, especially in South African agriculture, um, about um, the way farm workers are treated. So people are probably, I think, saying we won't buy products from South African farms, but if it's got some fair trade um, certification then there's a third party that's proved that somebody has gone and checked that and uh, I think that producers and processors companies are realizing that uh, that is definitely bringing them a market um, benefit and then to say something about specifically wild collection all of the standards the organic standards and the fair trade standards also 
have a wild collection component, but it's just a wild collection component. So um, if you farm, you could be certified, organic or fair trade. If you wild collected, it's a separate, it's the same audit, but it's a separate part of the checklist that the auditor looks at. And there's um, obviously there's things like sustainability and conservation in it. The fair wild standard is dedicated to wild collected products only, not farmed products. So that makes it a little bit different. And for that reason, the conservation side, sustainability, um, resource assessments, impact monitoring, is quite a strong part of the standard. And um, this is also probably the part and I'm, I'm saying this because you could bring it in when if you want to move across to animal products and especially if they're indigenous and wild animals um the the operator has to have quite a lot of information in terms of resource assessment sustainability the risk and the resilience of the species that they they targeting and then also the the danger of the collection activity to the environment and the landscape as a, as a whole. And this is a, this is a hard thing to do. Um, if an operator wanted organic certification, he could look up the standard and say, this is what I can use as a pesticide, and this is what I'm not allowed to use as a fertilizer. Pretty straightforward and technical. But there needs to be quite a bit of ecological expertise at the operator level. So what people mainly do, they will contract um, an expert, an ecologist or, or someone to do it. But of course, that comes at a cost. So I think you could just bear this in mind in your endeavors going forward. Um, the If I had to look at, for myself as a, as a, as a consumer, what would I look at? I would look at I want a sanitary safe product and I would be aware that the harvesting of that product or making that product uh, must not be environmentally unfriendly. It must be sustainable. Um, if it was a, a plant product, I would insist that there must be some sort of proof that there is sustainability, that the environment and the landscape is not being being harmed but if it came that first if i was eating an animal product then i would start um worrying have sort of you know fear humane considerations on uh, not only is it harvesting the animal sustainable but I'd, how can you prove that um you are harvesting that animal or culling that animal humanely that doesn't come into plant products and that's all i've ever worked with um, but certainly uh, on the humane side of things I, I do not eat battery chickens it's just it's my my personal choice um, I've seen them uh, battery products chickens um, and uh, factory farming are not allowed in in organic so I have done some organic um, uh, audits on that um, but certainly, just as a as a as a person, I um, I would be very aware of humane. So th this is a these I'm saying this so that you can think about it as you go forward um, in what you want to do and using um, animal products. Then also, just on the same note, just to show that I'm not the only person that thinks of of the humane side of things, is there are several private standards. Two of them, the one is there's a, a private mohair standard, which is basically run by a lot of fashion houses. And also there's an ostrich standard. I know these quite well because uh, my wife does the auditing on those standards. But these fashion houses um, and, and people like Jaguar, for example, who use mohair products in producing the car mats for Jaguar, um, they also subscribe to these private standards. And... Um, they insist that their suppliers will um, comply with the requirements of those those private standards. They are private standards. They're written by the the fashion houses themselves, but they are audited 
by a third party, by EcoCert, Ceres, and Control Union. Um, so that's just as a another indication to me that people are aware of the humane side of of things. So in the mohair, I've been with Mariana on two mohair audits, or well, the same place, but twice. Um, it's looking at how the 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 angora goats are treated from the cradle to the grave. Um, and by the time they get to the grave, they, they're not producing mohair any, anymore, but still Mariana has to go to the abattoirs. She has to see how they, they treat it. So the fashion houses are probably aware that the people who are buying from them are concerned about these things, but it just shows how these perceptions can drive an industry. And this, I think, you should be, uh, you know, bearing in mind in your endeavours. Thank you. This is exactly, you know, you, you used the phrase personal choice. It is personal choice times hundreds, thousands, and millions that drive the market forces behind this. So thanks for that, Val. Um, yeah, that, that I, I agree that that brings, again, the, the issues of sophistication of markets, and that is sophistication in terms of their buying power, their... Uh, what is important for them? You know, there are certain markets that really don't care about how sustainable the wooden beam that I've just used to build my house with. Um, I was just looking for the cheapest beam. And there are markets that will not buy uh, uncertified because they are concerned that that tree that went into the roof beam uh, was illegally harvested, always harvested by underage children or in the, and this, the whole series. This is where the whole series of elements in a standard come into play. So thanks for that. Um, Patricia, can you give us your perspective from a specific company and a specific family of products um, in the Zimbabwe context? Thank you. Um, thank you, Richard. Um, so for us as Bioba, I am working with Bioba um, in the operations department. I'm the chief operations officer. And we are dealing mainly with baobab, processing of the baobab fruit. Um, from that context, what we have found is that certification for us um, definitely um, causes us to stand out in terms of the export market. But on the domestic market, it's totally different. Um, the, the, there's no requirement for certification in terms of organic um, and fair wild. Um, what is really wanted is just the quality standards. Does it meet the requirements for either the processing or what the, the customers want? Um, but what I just wanted to add there is that even for the export market, we find that um, there are customers that are interested in sustainability, in what Fairwild stands for. But what comes with it that we find is difficult is that they're not really prepared to pay the premium. So we are producing a premium product, uh, a Fairwild product, we pay for the certification, and they, I think that that has already been covered by both uh, Valden and Gus, that there are costs associated with certification, especially Fairwild. Um, and when we sell that product to the customer, they are interested in sustainability. They're interested in fair um, distribution or of, of, of the benefit. But it's then, then to... Um, get them to agree to pay the premium product, the premium price for that product. That is where the challenge is. So it gets back to the fact that certification is at a cost and we do it so that it, uh, we, we get the market. But from that, we also expect to get the return um, that goes with the product. Um, and I found that definitely in terms of um, our, us as a producer, um, certification that um, has a bearing on sustainability is very important because what tends to happen is once, especially if it's a wild collected product, once the community knows that there's value, 
in the product, there is a danger of over harvesting from, from people that we are not really um, working with, possibly trying to sell it on the side to other players. So that in itself uh, would then need control, whether from uh, the regulating bodies and it to come with certification. Certification in itself would enable those that are dealing with those resources to regulate themselves so that there's no over harvesting, so that sustainability is in fact uh, ensured for, 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 for the resources that we're dealing with. So that's really to add on from what Gus and, and, and Valden have already shared about certification and the benefits that it has um, for the producer in my case. Great. Thanks, Patricia. That kind of wraps it. It's it's I think the point one of the points you raised there is the real need for a standard and certification system to differentiate itself, to to market, educate, and communicate itself to the point that the premium that you should be getting for having a certified product actually realizes um and and that is it's a it's a it's a thing that we typically as environmentally related people aren't particularly good at it's a it's a it's it it's kind of points out the need in these systems to have a section or, or a group within that within within the the standard organization and the certification that actually goes about actively marketing that and educating the consumer um, we certainly find it in our system so with that yeah i'd like to um ask prudence to come in and give us some questions give us some things to to carry on this discussion out of uh either out of the chat um ask us whatever questions there are and we'll see what we can reply and let's bring in um any of the attendees you know, use the chat box, please. Um, put questions up there for any of us. And we can use the last 20 minutes that we have in this session to answer those questions and uh, try and extend this discussion a bit further. Cool. Thank you, Dr. Ferguson. Thank you, everyone. I would like to ask uh, Nelson Mklanga to unmute and ask his question. He already posed a question on the chat, but I think to be better if he says it himself. Nelson? Uh, thanks a lot, Prudence. Um, I think this is quite an interesting discussion and one which is really worthy of the times and where we're going in Zimbabwe. And I think Gus can actually uh, bear witness to that. It's, it's quite an exciting space, this whole wildlife economy um, in natural, you know, non-tiba forest-based products. But I feel like the, personally, I feel like the Zimbabwean market is really not yet ready for this whole certification scheme, not trying to pour water on it, but then so many institutional frameworks brought from a legal perspective and also from a, you know, the market perspective needs to be addressed. Um, like what Holly was saying, you know, the, there's just so many standards out there. The producers, even the people in the market, they're confused. What exactly shall we go to and which one exactly is the best um, standard to subscribe to? Uh, but I think my question, um, I really like to look at things in an applied and practical way. And I posed it in the question um, in the chat box about the Zimbabwean context. How do we ensure and how do we support small scale community based groups to actually jump on board these certification schemes because they do not come cheap? That's a fact. So I'll leave that first question up there um, and maybe ask the other questions later after other participants have shared. Who wants to field that first? I can. Um, I think, uh, thanks, Nelson. That's a great question. Um, and just following on from what Patricia said, uh, I have a slightly different perspective uh, on the role of certification in the longer term. I'm not disputing what she says um, now um, because it's totally true. Uh, but I think with we've seen with organic certification that it's not so much a question of premiums because 
consumers don't really tend to pay premiums, then that's that's just a fact. Um, and we can complain about that as much as we want, but that's just the reality. We just have to get used to it and deal with it. Um, but the organic certification is used by uh, customers as a differentiator. Um, and and I think increasingly it's it's not going to be you know optional. If you want to survive in the market, you're going to have to do it. You have to be uh, ethically, sustainably certified because people just won't buy from you unless you are. Um, you have to be organically certified. I think we see that with Baobab. Um, when Baobab goes to a European customer, like it, it, they don't even ask if it's organically certified. They just assume it's organically certified. They ask you, please, can we see your organic certificate? Um, because it's like it's the very first tier on the kind of ladder of of uh, quality is is uh, it's organically certified. It's whatever, and then there's other standards that they that they also assume. So I believe going back to smallholders in Zimbabwe, um, it's not optional that they get certified. I think it's essential that they get certified. And I think we need to create the institutional framework that allows for that to happen. Yes, it's expensive. Yes, it's challenging. Um, yes, they cannot realistically be expected to uh, pre-finance the cost of certification themselves. Um, but there are a lot of support organizations out there uh, working with smallholders for whom I think certification, it should be a really obvious and an important uh, focus of their attention. Um, and, you know, if you are a donor looking to assist small scale farmers or small scale harvesters of, of products to get uh, into international export markets, um, then helping them to attain certification is a really simple and relatively uh, cost effective way of doing that. So uh, I don't think that there's anything to suggest. I mean, uh, Bioba has the uh, biggest small scale organic certification um, system, I think, in pretty much in Africa, uh, with over 5,000 certified um, Baobab harvesters, uh, which is amazing. Um, but that proves that it's totally possible and it can be done. Uh, so there's no a uh, question in my mind that it's it's viable, it's feasible, and um, this needs to be uh, something where we put at a policy level sustained uh, effort um, and investment to try to make it happen. Um, I have a question. Um, I wanted to know that... Um, what what would ideally go into these uh, standards for wild species? Like what what would what would be the criteria then if you were to come up with that? Well, from you know certainly from our perspective, you know the 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 system works on being what they call chamber balanced. In other words, there's a set of principles which are partly social, partly environmental, and partly economic. Um, and, you know, that, that, that's your kind of foundation for what is in a standard. Um, you know, it, 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 we've, each of the people involved here in, in the panel have touched on the social aspects, yeah. the costings, the, so, so the, the profitability of it, uh, which reflects the, the economic sphere and the environmental safeguards in the process. So, you know, certainly from our perspective, all three chambers need to be kind of equally agree. And, and, you know, in our standard development process, you have representatives of all three and they sit down around a table and they work through the criteria one by one and decide on those based on social, environmental and economic perspectives. Any other thoughts on those? Uh, could I maybe come in there with yeah. an idea? Or um, was the question, Prudence? Uh, you said, what are the criteria? Is that for conservation or for the species, the actual species that's been collected? Yes, Is like that... what would ideally go into the standards? Like what would you be looking at to make okay. it the yeah? Okay, so then what I'll do is um, it'll take two minutes, but the Fair Wild yeah. has six criteria that 
are in this and there's criteria for social and for business, but for the ecological side, the conservation side. So I'll just quickly read the six criteria because it'll give everybody a very good idea. So the first criterion is collected species are clearly identified and the conservation status is known and respected. So in other words, you're not going to shoot a reed buck if it's an endangered water buck or something like that. Um, location, tenure, management authority, and use rights of the collection area are clear, legitimate, and recognized. In other words, you've got permission to go in and use the targeted resource. Later, in under the social side, there's also access and benefit sharing agreements that the local community uh, benefits, but that's not ecological. Then the third one, resource management planning is adaptive and ensures that populations will be maintained over the long term. So that's the third one. Each criterion has got a whole lot of sub-criteria, which we call checkpoints, which the auditor looks at at the audit. Okay, then Impact of collection activities on habitat and the broader landscape, including non-target species, is assessed through a risk analysis and serves as the basis for implementing and monitoring appropriate measures. So you've got to do monitoring, and if you find that you are having an effect either on the landscape or the target species, you must adapt your activities. Management planning and implementation for the harvested species support neutral or positive impacts on the collection area and the broader landscapes. So at least do not do any harm, but preferably see if you can have a positive. Then the last one is sustainable collection and post-harvest practices are monitored to ensure they are implemented effectively. So that's basically that you would Train your collectors in harvesting and processing, and then you have some monitoring system to see do they obey their training. Cool. Thank okay. you for that. Um, unless if someone else wants to add, I have another question. There's no question in the chat um, because we're talking about the Zimbabwe context, and I know Patricia mentioned something about how the domestic market, the standards and, and the organicness of something doesn't really matter as much as when you export it. And I wonder if... But for products that are traded internationally, um, what role is there for the Zimbabwean government to facilitate and encourage their use? Um, I think let me just take that prudence. So um, when I was talking about the domestic market vis-a-vis -vis the export market, mm -hmm. uh, the products may be the same. Yeah. Um, and as Gus was saying, that certification differentiates us. But it really is about whether the market is ready for the differentiation. Um, to say, yes, the product may be organic. The customers locally would know that it's organic. But do they want to buy organic versus an uncertified product? That's that's where it is. You might have differentiated yourself, but it depends on the market to say, do they currently look out for that and say, we'd rather buy that in terms of volumes. And then um, on your question, you are saying, then how can the government uh, facilitate? So what I was feeling is that um, for now, because um, the market that really is uh, interested in that uh, is external, I think to, to motivate for certification, the government needs to have some form of incentives. For instance, exports. If, if there's exportation of that product, there should be export retention incentives. Um, as we know that nationally, when you export, um, a certain portion is, is, is liquidated. You can only retain a certain portion. So that's a mode of, uh, of, of motivating for more production of that type of product and also increasing exports. So if we have some form of incentives uh, pertaining to the export reten retention and also the costs of the permits, it's, you know, if for, for people to think that we need to, to, to export our product and that's where the market is that uh, requires this differentiation, the permits should not be prohibitive there must be some sort of a discount for certified goods 
uh, for certified products so that you encourage certification. And then also, I think what we've also noticed is that um, one of the requirements for certification are the operating permits that we have uh, nationally. Um, the government can look at that and see that those permits are also not prohibited so that we have more players. And if the players are certified, that is an incentive to say, well, look, get certified and then your, your permits might have some sort of a discount. So it's really motivating um, the, the, the current players or more players to want to have the certificate so that there is a benefit. Um, when I was talking about the premium, it's really to say once you have differentiated yourself, what you are saying is you should be able to get more for that product. And if your costs are less, it is also the same as getting more for the product. So I think that is a way that the government can actually facilitate or encourage uh, production or use of certified products. Thanks. They can, let me just chip in here also. You know, the extreme is that a government can make it mandatory that a practice is certified. You know, I, I bring the example of timber harvesting in Gabon. Uh, right now, that is moving to, it hasn't yet happened, but it's moving to a position whereby you as a interested party that wants a timber harvest concession uh, will not be able to even apply for it unless you can show that you have um, the credentials that will meet certification. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it can become a almost a policy thing from a government perspective to say, this is our bottom line. If you cannot meet this, don't even come and ask about harvesting these resources. Cool. Mm. That's good. Um, Gus, do you have anything to say? Yeah. yeah, maybe just a very quick one um, further on that in terms of government. Uh, there's a really interesting example in Kenya where one of the counties, um, which is a county on the slopes of Mount Kenya, and it's entirely small-scale farmers there. There's no large-scale commercial operations. And they have made a decision to move towards 100% organically certified production within their county, uh, which is completely remarkable. And they're setting up a lot of uh, infrastructure, um, centralized processing centers, um, local certification bodies, uh, routes to market. Um, if you go to the supermarkets in Kenya now, all of the supermarkets have a separate organic uh, produce section, um, which I've never seen an organic produce section in a Zimbabwean supermarket. Um, but in Kenya, that's quite standard. So um, I believe that uh, that it can happen, and I, and I think it will happen. I mean, that's, I think there's no doubt um, that ultimately the market will move in that direction, um, whatever, wh wherever we are on the scale. So, I, I mean, I think it's just, we, we all need to be prepared for it and we need to be proactively moving in that direction. But I think it's, um, it's pointless throwing our hands up in the air and saying, oh, the market's not ready for it. The market will be ready for it. And there's a lot that we can do to help accelerate that. Cool. Um, and, you know, even to, to add on to that, sorry, I'm just going to butt, butt in yeah. again. To add on to that, you know, even from, from our own side, kind of as the interested parties among the producer side of, side of it, it does more than uh, just look after the social and environmental kind of bottom lines that we set for ourselves. A decent standardized, a decent standard essentially forces the harvester or the producer to run their business effectively and efficiently. You know, the 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 basic um the basic record keeping, the basic communications, the basic those are they they should be basic standard business things. They're not necessarily environmental at all. Um, but having a standard that requires that you show evidence for those kind of forces you to run your business formally rather than a in Kenyan Juakali, you know, in, in Swahili, it's the Juakali sector, the informal sector. Um, it's kind of pushes towards uh, better run, better managed, formalized business. Yeah, if I can just um, use, you asked about what role can, can governments play. And I want to take the other extreme. Uh, Richard, you mentioned 
the, that um, possibly the government should insist on a form of certification. Um, in South Africa, and I'm sure it's true in Zimbabwe and many other African countries, we do not have any, we obviously don't have our own organic standard, but we have no rules and regulations about what you can call organic. So I can, when we're done here, I can go to our local supermarket and I can buy milk, eggs and flour, none of which we can get organic in South Africa because uh, there are, is no organic milk and all the eggs come from battery chickens, so they're not organically certifiable. And the the the, the, the flour is made from genetically mod modified stuff. So I can go buy those three things, make some pancakes and market it as organic. There's no rule. There's no ways I could do that in the European Union. You can't even export to the European Union. It's when it gets to the port of entry, the customs person, whoever does it, looks and says, oh, it's got the word organic on the label. How do I know it's organic? So they will need a um, certificate of inspection. In other words, that will be given by the, the certifying body. Um, so you, it's, it's illegal. It is in, in New Zealand and Australia as well. You can't use the word natural, ecological, on your product. Um, I found out about the organic shop in Hermanus. Hermanus is a very upmarket, quite wealthy people, retired people, uh, the sort of people that you would think would want to purchase organic. And um, quite by accident, I... Uh, I saw it, I walked past it. And then I went to my wife and I said, next time we're in Hermanus, which we go quite often, um, let's go to the shop. And it's called the organic shop. It's got hundreds of products, mainly things like skin creams and biscuits and that sort of thing. Hundreds of products. We know how to see if it's really organic. Not one, not one of the product was certified organic. If a product is certified organic, the whatever organic certificate certification is, European Union, um, Japan says, if you use the word organic on the label, you have to say what control body certified that product. It's got to be there. And you can use the U European Union organic logo or something. Not one of those products. And there were hundreds of them. Not one of them was really organic. So until we move towards some sort of regulation at that level. Um, I don't know. I don't think in, 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 in South Africa, we're not going to move forward. We've tried. We've tried. We've, we've tried to get a class action that it's, again, we have very strict labeling rules. So now you say this is organic fig jam, but it's not organic fig jam. It's against the labeling uh, rules. Sorry, Prof. Um, just to cut you in, sorry, but uh, we're running out of time. We okay, needed no. to stop okay, at no, the top of the hour. So um, the questions that we haven't gotten to, we can send them to the speakers and you can get your correspondence by email. Um, I'd just like to take this opportunity to thank everyone for coming and tuning in today. Uh, thank you to the speakers. Thank you for sharing your wealth of wisdom. Thank you for sharing your insights on the biodiversity report and on certifying the use of wild species. Just as a closing remark, I'd like to uh, just say a comment from Andrew Anderson, who says certification is highly dependent on the market or consumer. If the market or consumer is international, it would be essential to have certification in places, whereas local customers, then um, certification is not a barrier. And so with that said, if you've missed any of the previous talks, you can go to www.sharescreenafrica.org to find the previous talks. You can register for the not next talk on the Away website. But um, thank you, everyone, for tuning in today. Have a good afternoon, wherever you are. Goodbye.